Welcome to To Not Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of a Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament. Today, Ephesians chapter 6, Parents, Slaves, and the Devil. I had to make a long pause, Eric. I almost said, and the devil, Michael Scobie. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so horrible. Just the fact that I even thought of that is so bad. You should slap me. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, there's actually there's um there's a book. I forget the author of the book, but someone uh, wrote a book called "Who Crucified Jesus," and um, when it was published, they had his name right after the title of the book. So <laughs> <laughs> how convenient. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. didn't look too good right right yeah i feel you holy cow well good deal so uh so this is your title choice for today uh can't wait to hear more about it and likewise uh, of course i won't interrupt you because we had a little uh minute or two before the show uh you where i actually popped in a question i know you'll cover it so it'll be a good one for sure especially if it's right in the it almost kind of fits in the theme of like coincidentally some of the stuff we've had come up like we did a show with rabbi Stuart federo uh most recently with uh with the apostle paul um and then rabbi tobia singer and then we got into slavery and then uh we had of course this week's parsha and then now this is part of your title so kind of seeing if it's all going to connect together somehow so i'll turn you loose yeah it is pretty (laughs) it is pretty cool that the next shabbat is the chapter we're going to read mishpatim Mm -hmm, right um which goes, it begins with the laws of slavery, and that comes up in Ephesians chapter 6. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll cover all three of these issues awesome. uh, in, in this program. And we'll finish out the book of Ephesians, and God willing, uh, next week we should all live and be well. We'll start Philippians. Excellent. So, again, I've mentioned before that uh, many of these chapters um, – You know, Paul is dealing with mom and apple pie concepts. And, you know, when he speaks about being uh, good parents and et cetera, you know, there's there's no really massive room for any kind of critique or disagreement. Uh, So I just want to make a few points about how uh, Paul begins the chapter. He speaks about the importance of children obeying their parents. Um, and he says, this is the right thing to do. And then he quotes in the verse, the second verse, honor your father and mother, um, which he says is the first commandment with a promise. Um, I mean, another way of, of rendering that is the first commandment in the Bible with a reward. Usually when God gives us instructions, God either commands us to do something or prohibits us from doing something it's just God's will. He doesn't have to, you know, tell you that you'll get a cookie if you obey or you'll be able to, you know, uh, stay up an hour later if you obey. Um, very rare, actually, that the Torah promises you some kind of reward. Um, so we'll have to discuss this. Um, but, you know, when, when Paul begins by saying that it's important to obey your parents, Um, You know, it reminds me of an old saying I heard that there are many new and wonderful teachings in the New Testament. The only thing that's important to remember is that whatever is wonderful is not new and whatever is new is not wonderful. So here we have, you know, a a positive teaching, uh, an edifying teaching that it's important to obey and honor your parents. But again, that's not, this is not a revelation in the book of Ephesians. This is something uh, that was already taught. And so we're going to see in general that whatever you find in the Christian scriptures that is positive and edifying and wonderful, it's not brand new. It's already been taught in the uh, Torah that God gave to us. And if you find something that is brand new, and it was never revealed before by God, then it's probably not wonderful. Um, So it's true that honoring your parents is the first commandment in the Torah with a reward. We find it uh, in this past Shabbat's 
Torah reading in the Aseret Hadibro, the 10 statements from Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, where God says that if you honor your father and mother, kabed et avicha vetimecha, your days will be lengthened. That's interesting. And we find similarly when the, these 10 statements are repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5, so there in verse 16, it says you'll live long. Um, now, another commandment, actually there are only three that I'm aware of. The other commandments that pr promise reward, and it's interesting that the reward is always the same, lengthening of days, living long days, is in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 6 to 7, which is the commandment to send away the mother bird. The Torah speaks about a person that chances upon a nest of eggs, and if they want to take the eggs, they can't do it while the mother bird is there hovering over the eggs. You have to first send away, you have to shoo away the mother bird and then take the eggs. And the Torah there promises as well, it will be good for you and you will lengthen your days. And then the third commandment, um, which promises again, uh, living long on the land is in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 14 and 15, which is the positive commandment of having honest weights and measures. It's interesting that the Jerusalem Talmud tells a famous story in Tractate Hagiga about someone named Elisha ben Avuya. And he's famous for becoming one of the great heretics of the Talmud. Um, he basically abandoned the faith and he became a heretic. And the Talmud shares a number of possible reasons why this happened. Some of them were things from his early childhood. Um, but the Talmud explains, according to one opinion, that what really triggered him was that he saw an incident where um, a, a father asked his son to go get some eggs in, in a tree. And uh, so the son f was fulfilling the commandment to honor his parents. He was obeying his father. And he went up to the tree and there were eggs, but there was also the mother bird. And he sent away the mother bird. And so he, he's, he's performing now two commandments that promise long life. And in the middle of doing this, he fell out of the tree and he died. So Alicia Ben Avuya basically couldn't handle this, meaning that how, do you, how is it possible that the Torah promises long life for fulfilling either of these commandments? And here is a young boy that's doing both of them, and he dies not in old age, he dies very young. Rabbi Akiva in the Talmud explained that when the Torah promises long life or length of days, it's not referring to, you know, the fact that someone's going to live to be 115 years old. He's saying that it's really a promise for a long life in terms of enjoying a bliss in the world to come. It's speaking really about Olam Haba, the next existence in the world to come. And the Torah, I mean, the truth is that you probably will have this kind of a reward for fulfilling any commandment. But for some reason, the Torah promises and mentions this reward for these three commandments. It's interesting that the, t the sages had a, had a teaching where they said, schar mitzvah b'hai alma leka, that there is no reward for the commandments in this world. And that's really why the Torah doesn't really promise reward for the commandments. And Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler explained in his famous book, Mechtav Meliyahu, he explained that the reason that there's no reward for fulfilling the commandments in this world is that this world, this physical world we're living in, there's nothing that God could give you in this world that could ever really reward you for fulfilling one of his commandments, meaning that the performance and the fulfillment of the commandments is so awesome and the reward is ultimately so incredible that it's not something that could ever really be paid back or paid off in this world. 
you know, this is a world where the currency is very, very insignificant. I mean, a, a couple of dollar bills, you know, some more food, a nice car. This is like chump change. And really what the Talmud is saying is that the real reward for a commandment, for doing these commandments, which is fulfilling the will of God, it can't be anything in this world. This world doesn't have anything that is so valuable that it, it can basically be a reward for fulfilling God's will. That can only take place in eternity. That can only take place in the spiritual bliss, in the spiritual realm of the world to come. So this is, as Paul points out, this is the first commandment in the Bible that promises a reward. And the, the, Paul goes on to say that, and he specifically speaks about fathers. He tells them in verse four, don't provoke your children to wrath, um, but bring them up, he says, in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, this is an important teaching, and the Talmud actually prohibits parents from striking any child that is over the age of majority, meaning for a girl, it would be 12 years of age. For a boy, it would be 13 years of age. When a child reaches maturity, when they become responsible for the fulfillment of the commandments, so the sages teach us that a parent is forbidden to strike a child that reaches that age. And they explain that the reason is because it's putting a stumbling block before the blind. We, we learn in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14, that we're forbidden to put a stumbling block before the blind, which means to, to do something or to say something that will cause someone else to violate a law of the Bible. So if you strike uh, a mature person, you strike, uh, you know, a 13 year old boy, 13 year old girl, um, you know, it, it, they could even uh, look a, a six year old or seven year old could hit back. You know, it's sort of an instinctual thing to do. You hit someone, they hit you back. If, uh, if a minor, you know, a seven or eight year old kid strikes their parents, they're not yet responsible for the observance of the laws of the Bible. So there's no great consequence. But when a mature young person, meaning someone over the age of majority, if they were to strike their parent, that incurs the death penalty. Um, the Torah teaches us that um, in Exodus chapter 21, verses 15 and 17, that if a child either strikes or curses their parent, so if a parent hits their kid, he may, the, the child may not hit the parent back, but the child might curse the parent. And the Torah promises, the Torah says that that's a capital crime. So the sages say that because of that, a parent should never strike a child that's over the age of 12 or 13. Now, one of the things that's fascinating is that if you compare the, um, the formulation of this, it's the fifth of this, of the 10, the so-called Ten Commandments, really they're Ten Statements. We know that there are many more than Ten Commandments in the Bible. But the fifth is the commandment regarding the way we, we, we relate to our parents. And if you compare the version in Exodus chapter 20 to the version in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's a little bit of a difference. In Exodus chapter 20, it says, Kabed et avicha et imecha. Kabed is honor your father, avicha ve'etimecha, and your mother. Honor your father and mother. So it uses the word honor, and then it speaks about the father first, and then the mother. But in Deuteronomy, it says, ish imo ve'aviv tira'u. Each person should fear or be in awe of their mother and father. So there are two differences. In Deuteronomy, it speaks about fear or awe, and it speaks about the mother first, whereas in Exodus, it speaks about honoring, and it speaks about the father first. And Rashi, in his commentary to the Bible, explains that the reason is not hard to understand. He says that we are more likely to fear, to be in awe, to dread our father. The father is often 
not in all families, but is often, or at least uh, traditionally and historically, father was the one that carried out the punishments, that was the one that, you know, was the more uh, severe in the household. The mother was usually the one that the child would go to for support and comfort. So because the child would naturally fear the father more than the mother, so in Deuteronomy, the Torah says each person should fear their mother and father, meaning an emphasize is the mother because you would automatically more normally be in awe or fear or dread of your father. But when it comes to honor and showing love and respect, so again, because the mother is usually gentler and is more nurturing, person's more likely to feel that kind of closeness to their mother. So when it comes to honoring your parents, which is what we find in Exodus, there the Torah gives priority to the father over the mother because we're, we're less likely to be naturally inclined to honor and have this closeness with our father. So there in Exodus, the Torah says, honor your father and then your mother. Um, this is actually an interesting topic. We could go on for hours about all the teachings in the Torah and in the, and in the oral law and the Talmud and in the Midrash about parent-child relationships, but uh, we still have to cover slaves and the devil tonight, so we'll move on. So um, beginning with verse 5, Paul moves from the topic of uh, parent-child relationships to the topic of uh, servants and masters. And basically, Paul speaks very generally here about slavery and doesn't really treat the issue with a tremendous amount of depth. Um, it's actually the whole topic of slaves um, is a very controversial and sensitive issue. Um, we know that the central, or you could say one of the most central events in all of Jewish history, in the entire five books of Moses, is the liberation of the children of Israel from their Egyptian bondage. Um, you know, this is clearly a very, very central uh, point in the entire five books of Moses. And it's the reason why the Torah and, and God constantly uh, emphasizes the importance of recalling this event. We're constantly told to remember in so many different ways. We have an entire holiday, Passover, where you know we have to work hard to you know, change our entire homes. We have to get rid of all the leavened products and there's a tremendous amount of work getting ready for Passover. Our whole diet changes. And then during this holiday, we focus on the whole theme of remembering and reliving the exodus from Egypt. And then we, uh, you know, Jewish people that recite the Shema, the three, the three paragraphs uh, from the scripture every day, the third of those paragraphs from Numbers chapter 15 uh, recalls the exodus from Egypt. Um, men who wear phylacteries to tefillin, they have scriptures that recall the exodus from Egypt. Um, every time we celebrate Shabbat, the prayers speak about the Shabbat, speaks about this is uh, in commemoration of the exodus from Egypt. It's constantly uh, in the life of the Torah, we're constantly being reminded of the exodus from Egypt and our redemption from slavery. And one of the things that happens constantly is that it becomes the foundation of our entire ethical system because the Bible says so many times, don't mistreat uh, those who are disadvantaged because you know how it feels because you were slaves in Egypt. This is a critical, critical uh, concept that the Torah is constantly emphasizing. So the problem is that if this idea of liberation from slavery is so central to the Bible, how could the Bible permit slavery? I mean, it's, it's a, actually... It's a question that Paul doesn't really discuss. He seems to simply accept the reality that there are going to be masters and slaves. And so we should spend a few minutes. I'm sure that, you know, other guests on Tanakh talk have actually spoken about this since it's the right. Torah portion for next week. 
Um, but it's a very obvious and, you know, uh, I think sensitive question. How do we how do we relate to this? How do we deal with this um, problem of the Torah, you know, seemingly contradicting itself? On the one hand, emphasizing the importance of human freedom, and then in the next breath, basically accepting the institution of slavery. So I want to basically share two ideas here. One is just to understand the biblical concept of slavery. And it's interesting that while we use the word slave here, um, it's really got v almost nothing to do with uh, sort of the normative ways in which slavery has existed over the course of humanity. Um, basically, what we find in the Torah and the Bible are two kinds of slaves. The Bible speaks about an Eved Kna'ani, a non-Jewish slave, and an Eved Ivri, a Jewish slave. And a non-Jewish slave, um, a Gentile slave in the Torah, it could not be, you know, like <laughs> people would go to a different country and basically just grab people and, and, and force them to be slaves. This was not anything that was possible in the Bible. The whole institution of a non-Jewish slave, it had to be one where the person sold themselves willingly um, as a slave. And that was essential. And one of the things that's not well known is that when a non-Jew sold himself as a slave to Jewish household, they really had to undergo a quasi-conversion to Judaism. They became, they didn't become uh, technically Jews, but they had to live to a great extent as Jews. They had to follow quite a bit of Torah law. And the reality was that if, if within a year they refused to do this, they had to be set free. So this is obviously a very different kind of setup than the kind of slavery that we think of when we think of slaves. When it came to Jewish slaves, there were basically two ways a person could become a Jewish slave, an Eved Ivri. Generally speaking, what would happen, it was, it was an institution that applied specifically to thieves, to people that stole. We know in the Bible it says that if you steal, you have to pay back double. And so the question is, what would happen if someone stole and they didn't have the resources to pay this fine? Meaning that, you know, usually people stole if they were poor and they didn't have. So let's say they would take someone's cow. Uh, a cow is worth $1,000 or whatever. So if they get caught, they have to pay back $2,000. You know, a cow plus either another cow, which they don't have, or a cow plus a thousand dollars in cash, which they don't have. So if a person stole and they didn't have the funds to pay the double fine, then the court would basically sell um, the thief to the person that the thief stole from. That's a, when you think about it, it's kind of weird. You know, here you, you stole from someone and now you're going to be working for them. And the funds that were raised through the sale of this slave went to pay the um, original owner of the thing that was stolen, uh, pay them back the double fine that the thief wasn't able to pay. So that's what the general way in which um, people became an Eved Ivory, a Jewish slave. And again, this was a very rare occurrence. It wasn't that often that you had, because, you know, there was a very sophisticated uh, welfare system. You didn't have many people that were driven to steal. And not everyone that drove, that was driven to steal was so impoverished that they couldn't pay the fine. So you didn't have thousands of these um, Hebrew slaves, but occasionally it did happen. The second way um, was not that a person had to be sold to pay back the fine for theft, but if a person became so impoverished for some reason, um, literally they, they didn't have any money at all and they fell through the cracks of the social welfare system, then they could choose to sell themselves into slavery uh, in order to uh, work and 
you know, be sustained. Now, what's important to understand is that this Hebrew slave um, was not really a slave. This is one of the main revolutions of the Torah, is that it redefined the entire concept of slavery as we're going to see. So it says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 40, that the, the person that sold himself or was sold, they were not enslaved. They were not working as a slave. They basically worked as a hired hand, as an indentured servant. And they only worked for six years. The person that was sold um, by the court or sold himself into, into um, this indentured slavery uh, only worked for six years and or until the jubilee came every 50 years was the jubilee year and if the jubilee year came within the six years they would also go free so the person um, that was sold by the court worked either for six years or up until the jubilee whichever came first the person had the uh, right if they chose to to continue their uh, indentured servitude, meaning that after six years, the person could say that I really, I, I, I prefer this kind of life. I like my master. I like my wife that I have here. And they could choose to remain uh, as an Evid Ivory. But we know that the Bible teaches us that the master had to go and put the ear of this servant up against a door frame and with an awl, pierce the ear, pierce the earlobe of this uh, Evid Ivri, of this uh, Hebrew slave. Um, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter asked a very interesting question. He said, normally, you know, the court was in charge of administering uh, punishments or any kind of procedures. Um, it's sort of unusual that the master, the owner of this indentured servant, would be the one that would take this servant and pierce his ear with an awl. Um, and it's actually a, a very unpleasant thing to do. You know, it, it's almost like we're inflicting this job upon the master, upon the you know, employer here. And Rabbi Yassel Salanter asked the question, why? Why doesn't the court do it? You know, if this person chooses to work in an additional six years, so why make the master do this gruesome thing um, when normally it would be the kind of uh, procedure that the court would administer. And he says something fascinating. He says that, that really there is some guilt here that is borne by the master in that he allowed this person working for him to become dependent, meaning that one of his responsibilities should have been to foster uh, a spirit of independence in this person so that after six years, he wouldn't want to keep on staying. And if this person after six years wants to keep on staying there and working, that's not healthy. And while it's not entirely the fault of the master of the employer, they bear some responsibility. And so Yisrael Salantra says that they were slapped on the wrist with this uh, requirement to be the one to pierce the ear of the servant. Um, now, in terms of some of the rules of these quote unquote slaves, again, they're not really slaves. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the rules because it would take hours, but let me just share some of the highlights. First of all, you know, we know in the ancient world, uh, slaves were treated like chattel and a, a master could kill them at the drop of a hat. So we know that in the Torah, we're told that any Jew who kills a slave, either a Jewish slave or a Gentile slave, they are held responsible for capital punishment, meaning that it's a capital crime and they could be put to death for killing their slave, whether it's a Jewish slave or a Gentile slave. This is totally unacceptable, not just that it's unacceptable to kill or murder a slave, but any Jew who injures a slave, whether it's a Jewish slave or a Gentile slave, even if it's something minor like knocking out a tooth, the slave automatically goes free. Now, again, we know that in the ancient world, this was, um, it was unbelievable how badly slaves were treated. You know, they would often blind slaves 
in order to make them more handicapped, uh, in order to just keep them uh, sort of uh, tethered to a simple uh, menial job that they wouldn't have to see, um, you know, they would in some degree blind their slaves. They would beat slaves mercilessly. And a Jewish slave owner was not allowed to beat um, a slave, to injure a slave. And if they did, again, the slave would simply go free. Um, we see this in Exodus chapter 21, verse 26. Now, according to the oral Torah, according to our sages, um, a Jew who possesses a Eved Ivri, a Jewish slave, is responsible for educating and raising, meaning that he has to basically take care of the Eved Ivri, of this Jewish slave. So let's say it was a 15-year-old kid that stole something and couldn't pay back. He'd have to pay for the education of this young man. Um, he's got to dress uh, any slave working for him in respectable clothing. He couldn't dress the slave in tatters. You have to provide a comfortable bed and quality food for the slave. And if the owner doesn't have uh, enough of these, meaning that if, let's say, that he doesn't have uh, a quality bed, so according to the Jerusalem Talmud, it's the slave that gets the good bed. Meaning that the, the Talmud says that if there are two pillows in the house, so the slave gets one and the master gets one. And if there's only one slave in the house, one, one pillow in the house, the slave gets it. That's one of the reasons why the rabbis taught that anyone that acquires a slave acquires a master. Because really the regulations of treating them, they had to be treated so well that it was often very difficult to meet the obligations of how we're supposed to treat those that work for us. Um, the master of the slave, the owner, has to also sustain and support the wife and the children of the slaves that work for them. Um, it's interesting that according to the, the sages, um, you can't change the trade of a slave, meaning that a person that that is sold into slavery or sells himself into slavery is has to continue using the skills that they were trained for, that they have used previously. And let's say they were a tailor or let's say they were a, um, you know, they, they were a baker, whatever they did, whatever they were trained for, that's what you have to have them do. And you can't force them to simply do any kind of menial work. Um, and additionally, the Torah tells us, the Torah teaches that if a slave runs away from their master, you're not allowed to return the slave. You cannot extradite the slave to their master. And if you find this slave, you're required to take care of their needs. It's an incredible teaching. Um, this is actually an explicit verse in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 16. Um, we know, of course, that on Shabbat, the Torah does not just prohibit the master from doing labor, meaning that not only are Jews prohibited from working on the Sabbath, but both Jewish slaves and Gentile slaves are not allowed to do any work for the master on the Sabbath. Um, and it's very interesting. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 13, you shall not perform any labor, you, your sons, your daughters, slaves, maidservants, oxen and asses, and all the animals in your courtyards, in order that your slaves and maidservants shall rest like you. Now, the Torah just could have said, in order that your slaves and maidservants rest. But the Torah adds these two, this word, kamocha, like you. And I believe the reason is because the Torah is really teaching us, ultimately, the slave is just like you. We are all created in the image of God. And we're all human beings. And at the end of the day, so someone might be working for you for a period of time, but you're not allowed to think of yourself as ultimately uh, higher than the person working for you. Torah says that the slave is kamocha, is just like you. And so this is an incredibly uh, liberating idea that 
that the slave is not allowed to do any work for you on the Sabbath. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 13, we're told that this is unbelievable, that there was severance pay. You know, we think of this as a modern thing, that if you work at a company and they let you go, then they have to pay you severance. This is actually back in the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 13, that the Torah says you have to pay severance to any departing slave. So this is just a taste of some of the laws in the Torah where we see that what happened was that the entire institution of slavery was essentially redefined, where it really has almost nothing to do with the um, institution of slavery as we know it. So let me just share uh, two more thoughts about this. So ultimately, how can we understand why the Torah may have, um, despite its, its uneasiness with slavery, why did the Torah uh, allow slavery? So I'll share two thoughts. One I found by Rabbi Pinchas Wolf, who shares something interesting. He says that we know that ultimately the Torah is supposed to impact the entire world. And if the Torah had simply banned slavery, then it's possible that the Jewish people would have gotten rid of slavery altogether, but the rest of the world would have totally ignored uh, this teaching. You know, they would have, in the same way, you know, we know that when the Torah taught uh, the idea of the Sabbath, the Romans 2,000 years ago thought the Jews were insane. A day off, you're not going to work seven days a week. So, Rabbi Wolf says that what the Torah did instead of banning slavery was that, as we saw, it radically improved the concept of slavery. It, it, it humanized the entire institution of slavery and it improved the conditions of those people who were slaves. And so the land of Israel became a virtual paradise for slaves. And we know that in the ancient world, slaves would often uh, run away. And they would try to find a place in Israel where they could become slaves because they know that tr slaves are treated so much better there. And once this was known, once people in the world f discovered this idea that people were running away to become slaves in Israel because of the way they were treated, so that would impact the way people outside of Israel were treating their slaves, meaning that it would have the potential to help improve the lot of slaves throughout the world. Now, a second idea is that the Torah understands that we can't simply legislate massive change in the world. And I'll give you an example. Um, we know that the Torah didn't ban polygamy. Um, polygamy seems to have been tolerated in the Bible. Um, but it's very clear from the Torah that polygamy is a horrible institution. And we see this, I mean, if you just look at every single story in the Bible where there are multiple wives, uh, it's horrible. Um, actually, the Hebrew word for co-wife is tsara. Tsara means misery. <laughs> so it, it's a disastrous kind of institution. Wow. And wow. The, the very first time, it's very interesting, there's a, there's a story in the beginning of Genesis where Lemach um, makes this strange speech to his wives. And, you know, none of the commentaries really understand what's going on. You know, he, 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 he makes this very passionate speech. He says, you know, listen to me, you wives of Lemach. You know, did I kill a man for bruising me or wound a man for hurting me? If Cain was paid back seven times, I'll be paid back 77 times, something like that. I mean, it, it sounds like he's going on this rant out of the blue. What's going on? And the, the commentary struggle with understanding what's going on behind this speech. But there's a commentary called the Bechor Shore who says that this is understandable if you look at the context. Because right before his rant, it tells us that Lemach married two wives. 
And this is the first story in the Bible of polygamy. And so the Bechor Shor suggests that here he's living in a home with two wives and it's just World War III and it's, 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 it's a living hell for him. They're driving him crazy. They're fighting all the time. You know, who's going to sleep with him? Who's going to, I mean, it's just, it's hard enough to be married to one person. And here, this poor guy, he takes two wives and his life is in shambles. So he basically screams out at them in frustration. What did I do to deserve this? Did I kill anyone? Did I hurt anyone? If Cain, right, who was a murderer, if, if he was a guilty person and he was paid back in seven generations. So for me, it'll be 77, meaning he was basically expressing a frustration born out of the difficulties of living in a home with more than one wife. And we see throughout the rest of Genesis and other stories in the Bible, polygamy is just a disaster. But the Torah really was dealing with a time in history when it was normal and you couldn't simply just legislate it away. And so what the Torah seems to do is to have rules to make marriage more manageable and through the teachings of the Torah, through these stories and through other teachings to gently guide people to realize this is not a great idea. And so what happens is at some point in Jewish history, we came to understand our on our own. We didn't need the Torah to tell us that polygamy is should be banned. We banned it on our own. And so the same thing really takes place with slavery. It would have been almost impossible 3,000 years ago to prohibit slavery. It was just part of life. It was the way of the world. And so the Torah ultimately wants slavery to end, but it wants us to end it. And so what happens is the Torah takes the institution of slavery, it limits it, it humanizes it, and it puts a context around slavery where it teaches the lesson through many other teachings that I mentioned before, that slavery itself is abhorrent. It's, it's really not a positive institution. And so hopefully the Torah is banking on the idea that over time, people will on their own come to appreciate that slavery is something that we should not accept. And that's what happens ultimately, that it wasn't the Torah that had to tell us you can't have slaves. The Torah pointed us in that direction and people ultimately came on their own to reject slavery. Um, now, the last topic we want to cover for tonight, um, Paul brings up, he brings it up in verse 11 here, but it comes up throughout the Christian Bible. Um, he says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now this topic, I think we've discussed it before, um, but it's a, it's a ubiquitous topic in the Christian Bible. It's interesting that in the Tanakh, which is much bigger, Tanakh is much, much bigger than the, than the Christian scriptures, you find a handful, maybe a handful of references to Satan, to Satan. Um, in the Christian Bible, I think it comes up 200 times. Um, so I just wanted to share a few thoughts um, about this idea of devil and Satan. Um, you know, there's a very interesting story about an argument that used to take place between the uh, Chabad Hasidim, Lubavitch Hasidim, and the Belzer Hasidim, two Hasidic groups. And they were debating and they were arguing about what's the optimal way to pray. And so Bells used to say that you should pray very quickly, pray very quickly. They said the reason is because you have to imagine, they said, that you're in a carriage, you're in a wagon. And you have these little hooligans that are just throwing rocks at you, and you got to get away from them. So the Belzer Hasidim said that that's what's happening. We're trying to pray, and the Satan, what we often call the evil inclination, the Yetzirah, our inner adversary, um, this Satan is trying to interfere with our prayers. And so the Belzer Hasidim said that in the same way, 
you know, you got these little hooligans throwing rocks at you in the wagon. You got to whip the horses and get out of there quickly. So he said, pray quickly, you know, that they, you don't sit, you know, over each word for too long and give the, the Satan the opportunity to mess up your prayers and distract you and uh, destroy your prayers. Chabad, the Lubavitchers, said no. He said, the idea of making your wagon go really, really, really fast doesn't make sense if those little bratty hooligan kids are in the wagon with you. <laughs> if they're chasing after the wagon, you can get away from them. But if they're in the back of the wagon <laughs> and they're throwing rocks at you from the back of the wagon, you can't get away from them. And so they said you have to pray very slowly with a tremendous amount of concentration. And that's the only way you're going to defeat the uh, Yetzirah, the evil inclination, the Satan. And the point here is that I, I think this is one of the contrasts between the Christian concept of Satan, of the devil, and the Jewish biblical idea of the Satan, the Sahara. Uh, in Christianity, the Satan is really an external force to human beings, and it's really external to God. I mean, they see Satan as a rebellious angel that led a rebellion with all these demons against God. And they see Satan as this leader of an opposing team against God. And all of history and all of human life is basically this battle between the good guys and the bad guys. Um, from a Jewish point of view, this is basically heresy because in the Torah, we teach that there's nothing that is independent of God. God is the author of everything. Isaiah says, God forms light and darkness, good and evil. So in the Torah, Satan is not independent of God. It didn't go rogue against God. Satan works for God. Satan is on God's team. God uses Satan for very important purposes. As a matter of fact, the Midrash, the rabbis teach in the Midrash that after the creation of the world, after the six days, Right, God had said after every single day, God saw that it was good. But after the entire creative process, it says God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And the sages in the Midrash say very good. That's referring to the Satan. That's referring to the evil inclination. Because the, the, the sages teach us that this Satan is our loyal opposition. The whole purpose of the Satan is to help us grow. In the same way, if you go to a gym, the only way you can grow your muscles is by overcoming resistance. So the only way you can overcome, the only way that you can grow as a human being, grow spiritually, is by overcoming resistance. And that's the purpose, that's the role of this Satan, this Yetzirah, Harad, this inner adversary. You know, the first time the word Satan is mentioned in the Bible is in Numbers chapter 22, verse 22, where it speaks about um, Bilaam going to curse the Jewish people and God sends an angel to obstruct him. And there it's used as a verb. God sent an angel, lis Satan, to be an adversary, to be an obstruction. And But that's the whole purpose of Satan. Satan is sent by God to obstruct our path, to be a roadblock. And that's the whole purpose of our Yetzirahara, our inner adversary, that it provides the resistance that we have in life to be able to grow. We grow by overcoming the obstacles that are thrown in our path by the Yetzirahara, by our evil inclination. And if we didn't have this, we would never grow. So on the one hand, we think of it as our enemy. On the other hand, it's our best friend. And that's why the rabbis say it's very good. You know, uh, I, I always mention that I'm a, a very serious chess player. So in the, the last, you know, decades, one of the great players was Garry Kasparov from the Soviet Union. So Garry Kasparov had an arch enemy in chess, Anatoly Karpov. And they played many, many dozens of games together. And they were, you could say that Karpov was his arch enemy. On the other hand, he was the greatest thing that ever happened to Kasparov. Because right. if Kasparov didn't have that kind of top kind of very high competition, very steep opposition, 
he would never have become the great chess player he became. And that's why the Talmud teaches us that the greater the person is, the greater becomes their evil inclination, meaning a person's wow, evil wow. inclination grows with you, meaning when you're a little nobody, right, then you don't need stiff opposition, meaning that even a little pipsqueak can give you a hard time. But when you become great and you overcome your evil inclination and you become stronger, God needs to make it stronger to fight against you. And so it's there our entire life to help us grow. And this is an important concept. You know, the Torah tells us that we are here in this world to grow and to create ourselves. Everything else in the world was created unilaterally. Everything else, God just said, let there be. Let there be dogs, let there be cats, let there be giraffes. But when it came to the human being, God said, let us make man. God is saying to us, I can't create you. I can create a dog or a cat because basically a dog is a dog is a dog. They might get bigger over the years, but they don't become more of a dog. They don't grow in their dogness. But a human being is a work in progress. And God is saying, I can't create you. All I can give you is the raw ingredients. I can give you a body and a soul, but who you will become is a function of what you do with those raw ingredients. And so God does not say after the creation of man, God saw that it was good. Everything else said God saw that it was good, meaning that it was perfectly formed. But after the human being, it doesn't say that because it depends on what you do with yourself. Some people go through an entire life and they don't do anything to grow. Unfortunately, they waste an entire life doing absolutely nothing. They don't become bigger people. They don't become greater people. They don't grow in terms of their personality traits. They don't become more generous. They don't become more sensitive. They don't become more humble. Uh, they don't have more gratitude. That's what we're here in this world to do. We're here in this world to create ourselves. God said, let us make man. Who is God speaking to? God is speaking to each one of us. God is saying, you and I will create you. I, God, will give you the raw ingredients, but you have to make something out of yourself. And so the Bible says that we're called Adam, Adam, because we come from the Adama, from the earth. And just as the earth is pure potential, you can have a plot of land, and if you don't take care of it, it'll be just basically weeds and, and nothing going happening there. But if you got a, the same plot of land and you take care of it properly, you plow it, you seed it, you water it, you fertilize it, you do all the things that are necessary, you can have a beautiful garden there. So just like earth, Adama, is pure potential. Each one of us, when we're born, is pure potential. Each one of us has the potential to become great. Or, unfortunately, if we don't work at overcoming our inner adversary, we won't grow at all in life and we'll be, you know, an 80 year old person that's really hasn't gone much further than they were eight years old. Now, why do I bring all of this up? Because one of the great questions of all theology is why did God create us in the first place? Why did God create human beings? And I believe that Christianity and Judaism both have the same answer, that God ultimately wants to bless us. God wants us each to have the ultimate blessing that is possible. And that is, according to both of us, according to Judaism and Christianity, the greatest blessing a human being could have is fellowship with God. The greatest blessing that anyone could have is to have closeness and intimacy with God, to be attached to God. So the ninety, the $64,000 question is, so if that's God's ultimate goal, why did God stick us in this ridiculous physical world in a physical body? Why did he put our souls down here? He could have just created souls and stick them right into heaven, put us right into heaven. And then each one of us would be a soul basking in the, in the radiance of God's presence. So why didn't God do that? And why did God send us down here? I don't know if Christianity really has an answer to this question. Judaism has an answer. The answer that Judaism gives is that if you get something for free without working for it, it's not worth anything. You get no pleasure out of it. No one likes a handout. 
no one likes to feel like they're getting charity, like they they couldn't work for it. And the Christian model basically is exactly like that, that you don't really earn your salvation. You get it as a free gift. And the Torah is abhorred by that. The Torah feels that if you didn't work for your salvation, if you didn't work for your share in the world to come, it would be very cheap. It would be meaningless. And so according to the Torah, God put us in this world to grow. God put us in this world to overcome our evil inclination. And that's why at the very beginning of the Bible, God says to us, you can overcome it. Sin will always tempt you, God says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. You'll always be tempted to do the wrong thing. But God says you can overcome it. You can rule over it. But the Christian model says you can't rule over it. You can't overcome Satan unless basically Jesus does it for you. And so I think that if we understand the whole concept of why we're here as human beings, understanding really the role of Satan the role of the devil, the role of our evil inclination becomes much clearer. In Christianity, Satan does not have a positive role whatsoever. It's totally seen as um, contrary to God's plans. From the Jewish biblical perspective, it's the exact opposite. Satan is on God's team. Satan is here to help further God's agenda. God wants us to be tested. God wants us to overcome these tests. God wants us to grow. And as we grow and we become bigger and bigger and bigger people, we become more of a receptacle that's able to actually benefit from and appreciate the blessings of the spiritual world we're heading to. If God just plops you down into the spiritual world and you don't do anything at all to prepare for it, you don't do anything at all to work for it, you're not going to have the same appreciation. So I think that Paul's obsession with the devil is understandable from a Christian point of view. Um, for him, the way you fight the devil is you just hold up the cross and you say, look, Jesus, is, has, Jesus has vanquished the devil for me. We've discussed in the past that in truth, Jesus did not vanquish the devil. The devil is still there fighting Christians to this very day. But at least Christians believe in some sense that Jesus has taken care of the devil for them. Um, but the model is where someone does it for you. You're passive. You're passive. Someone does it for you. Um, the Jewish model, the biblical model is, no, God believes in you. God believes that you have the ability to overcome temptation and you can grow and you can make yourself into something. And so for the Bible, for the Torah, the Satan plays an incredibly important positive role um, in terms of our ability to grow as human beings and to have access to greater, greater, greater blessings in the world to come. Um, so those are the three topics I wanted to cover for tonight. Our relationship to our parents, our uh, understanding of the institution of slavery, and a little bit of insight into the concept of the devil. And with that, uh, I wanted to bring the book of Ephesians to a close. Yep. Good job. And yep. uh, <laughs> <laughs> hope to see you next week. I'll tell you what, this was, uh, this was uh, I'm hearing my echo, my voice in the echo for some reason. Um, so this was a really, really great show, in my opinion. I just, I love the topics. I love uh, how you connected everything together and how it also tied in with the weekly Parsha. Um and it's just packed full of wisdom. And uh, all your shows are, but I mean, some of them stick out to me more than others. And this just happened to be one of them. I'm, I'm one for sure that I'm going to be going back and, and re-listening re to uh, from the beginning just to hear the wisdom you've actually brought to us tonight. So um, I really appreciate uh, your work, sir. And thank you very much. I appreciate your work. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for you, this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> well, Peru Kishim, it's going to continue, uh, Hashim willing. And so... Uh, for years and years to come, as soon as I can get my son uh, uh, less camera shy, I might I'm gonna introduce him in a few times and and just to kind of well, how do you say get his feet wet, <laughs> so to yeah. speak. But I think what's gonna happen though is uh, with him, I'm going to teach him how to do the producing part, and I'm just gonna stay behind the camera because um, he seems to like computers and knobs and you know things like that. So, all right, Rabbi Dynasty. 
Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Love you, Rabbi. You have a great, great rest of your week. Shalom, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hashem willing. Take care. Bye-bye. God bless you. Thank you.